Hey everyone, and welcome back. I'm Pastor Zach, and this is our uh, weekly Bible study in which we are going through the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Ezra, about Nehemiah chapters 5 through 7 or so. Um, feel free to pause this video and go read those if you'd like. Also, if you'd like not to, that's fine too. We're going to read and summarize a lot of the story together as well. Uh, just to recap really briefly, remember Nehemiah is a fellow we met last week. He was the king of Persia's cupbearer, which uh, was also a kind of close friend of the king. Um, somebody that the king trusted a lot, and Nehemiah was distraught that the city of Jerusalem still had no walls, that the uh, gates had been burned down, that it was vulnerable, and it was just kind of a junky, run-down city. And so he convinced the king to give him permission and resources to go back and rebuild the wall. And we read last week that he went around, he surveyed the wall, and then he divvied up the work by uh, who lived where, essentially. So if you lived in this district, you worked on that wall, really to give you a sense of uh, having some skin in the game. You know, so you took some pride in the work that you did, knowing that that part of wall would defend your house. <laughs> and we talked a little bit last week about what the work is that's right in front of us as well. So you also might remember that uh, there were a couple of people who were not super big fans of this project. Uh, in particular, uh, we had Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab. These are governors from the surrounding regions that are not Judea. And they will come back and be important today. So we're going to start with Nehemiah chapter 5, and I'm just going to read to you from the Common English Bible because I think that... This is just better than me summarizing it. It's not long either. So. Then there was a great protest of all the people and their wives against their fellow Jews. Some said, with our sons and daughters, we are many and we need grain to eat and stay alive. Others said, we have to mortgage our fields, our vineyards and our houses in order to get grain during this famine. Still others said, we have had to borrow money against our fields and vineyards in order to pay the king's tax. We are the same flesh and blood as our kin, and our children are the same as theirs. Yet we are just about to force our sons and daughters into slavery, and some of our daughters are already slaves. There is nothing we can do since our fields and vineyards now belong to others." Now, I was very angry when I heard their protests and these complaints. After thinking it over, I brought formal charges against the officials and the officers. I told them, wait, you're all taking interest from your own people? I also called for large assembly in order to deal with them. Quote, to the best of my ability, I said to them, we have brought back our Jewish kin who had been sold to other nations, but now you are selling your own kin. Who must then be bought back by us? And at this, they were silent and they were unable to offer a response. So I continued. What you are doing is not good. Why don't you walk in the fear of our God? This will prevent the taunts of the nations that are our enemies. I myself, along with my family and my servants, am lending them money and grain, but let's stop charging this interest. Give it back to them right now. Return the fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and give back interest on money, grain, wine, and oil that you are charging them. They replied, We'll return everything and won't charge anything else. We will do what you asked us. So I called the priests and made them swear to do what they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my robe, saying, So may God shake out everyone from their house and property if they don't keep this promise. So may they be shaken and emptied. And the whole assembly said, Amen. Probably a real shaky amen. And praise to the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. So what these wealthy Judeans were doing 
was in a time of famine, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of grain being gathered from these small family farms. Also, a lot of these people who would normally be working the farms were building the wall. And so they were not home to harvest and, you know, pick weeds and make sure things are watered. And so productivity in the farms was down, but demand from the king for taxes and for food were still high. So you have this perfect storm. And as is often the case when there's a perfect storm of financial instability, of maybe uh sickness or increase in costs or whatever it may be, those who are wealthy, those who are at the very tippy top, see opportunity, not tragedy. And so they offer all of these loans to the poor workers for, you know, high interest rates because it's an emergency loan. And they force the people to put up their property as collateral, their homes, their farms, um, their vineyards, and sometimes even their own children. Uh, the text says that many of our daughters have already been sold into slavery. Um, I don't probably don't need to tell you the exact form of slavery that would have been. Um, but this is awful. This is awful. And, you know, the worst part is this is this is kind of a tricky gray area in terms of the actual uh, Torah, the actual law. What they're doing is not technically illegal. It's wrong, but it's not technically illegal. So Nehemiah doesn't appeal to the law the way maybe Ezra would have. He applies, he appeals to their souls. It doesn't matter if this sort of practice is legal. It's wrong. No nation can thrive when the 1% crushes the working poor to extract even more wealth and power. It doesn't matter what the excuse is is. doesn't matter how legal it is. doesn't matter how traditional it is. It is not sustainable for a country to oppress itself. It creates social divides. It breeds dissension. This is how you end up with revolutions and violent revolts. Also, people die. Okay? This is a bad thing, generally when people starve unnecessarily while other people are gorging themselves unnecessarily. It also, this is kind of the reason why God took the land from the people in the first place, according to, you know, basically every prophet ever. So Nehemiah sees that the people, the rich people in Judea, are already back up to their old tricks. I mean, and this isn't just a Judean rich people. This is literally every class of rich people in every society that has ever existed in which they've been able to do this sort of thing. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry if that's offensive. I don't know. But I imagine what would happen if U.S. society were able to take, a, take this passage seriously. Um, if the predatory lenders in the U.S. agreed to return interest payments, to return late fees, confiscated properties, foreclosures, all of the evictions, if all of that in which things that were taken away from people who had fallen on hard times, if all of that was just returned, I wonder what that would be like. I mean, for a nation that claims to be built on Judeo-Christian values, this feels like one of the ones that pops up pretty regularly. Actually, debt forgiveness is not some kind of liberal fantasy. Um, it's a biblical reality. And unlike some of the other times, like we talked about the year of Jubilee a few weeks ago, the, the book of Nehemiah says this actually happened. The people actually listened. And then this is how they built their new society. They chose to build their new society without predatory lending practices in which people fell on hard times and then they weren't instantly crushed because of it. <sighs> that's, that's, hmm. That's the kind of thing that maybe you want to take a second to think about, to dwell on, maybe even pause the video if this is not Wednesday evening and think about. Hmm. But this work, though the people were able to keep going uh, without worry of losing their entire livelihoods, <coughs> It was not without its further challenges. Um, remember those pesky governors I mentioned earlier? 
they try three times in the next chapter alone <laughs> to get to Nehemiah. The first time, the three of them send him an invitation to come meet him in, meet them in one of the local towns and, you know, bury the hatchet, Nehemiah. Let's, let's get together. Let's talk like governors and let's just work this thing out together. Okay. We're all brothers here. Come, let us come here. And Nehemiah instantly sees that as an assassination attempt, which I don't know, it probably was and tells them, I'm sorry, I'm really busy right now. I'm building this wall and uh, sorry, can't come. So that angers them because yes, it was an assassination attempt. Um, so they try to send, well, they do send this open letter to Nehemiah, um, formally accusing him of seeding sedition and of uh, rebelling against the king. Now it's an open letter so that Anyone who comes across it can read it, and this is not a secret letter to the king. This is meant to spread dissension and discord. Nehemiah, however, he's not shaken. He's personal friends with the king, and he knows that this is not true. He's also convinced that the work that he's doing is divine, and that God is going to complete the work that he called him to do. And so he just keeps going. He doesn't listen to the haters, and he doesn't let that bring him down what other people might be thinking about him. And he keeps going. So next, he is summoned by a local prophet named Shemaiah, who, who warns him that there is an invasion, an imminent invasion coming before they can finish the wall. He tells them that God has told him of this invasion and that God has also told him to flee to the inner part of the temple, to bring... Uh, all of the priests and prophets and to flee to the inner part of the temple where God will keep them safe in the Holy of Holies where those infidels out there cannot enter. Nehemiah, his uh, BS detector goes off and he goes, ah, uh, no, I know that a king is not allowed in that inner sanctum. And this is one of those things that previous kings got wrong before um, the destruction of the temple. This is a trap. And then he comes to light that uh, Tobiah the Ammonite had actually paid this prophet to pretend to hear the words of God in order to trap Nehemiah and get him uh, expelled by the Jewish authorities. So not everyone who claims to speak for God actually has a word from God to give. Some people who claim to speak for God are actually speaking for their own wallets. Sorry if that's harsh. <laughs> Finally, Tobias tries to leverage his own business and familial relations with the elders and wealthy citizens of Jerusalem, and he writes letters back and forth to these families, um, telling them the sorts of things that they should do to foment dissension while those families are also informing Tobiah on what Nehemiah is doing on the inside. See, Tobiah had married off his children to Judeans, and he was close to many of the families and wealthy business people. And this is the sort of messy intermarriage that Ezra warned the people about a few chapters ago and forced some people to be divorced from because... This sort of conflict of interests can get really messy and uncomfortable. But despite the constant negativity, especially from the powerful and the rich and those who would threaten him, Nehemiah never lost sight of his job, of his work, and he kept going. And 52 days after he started, they finished the final gate and locked the doors and set up guards on the walls. And the city was protected and safe. And how, how on earth could this man pull this all off in 52 days? Well, we said on the first day, Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Prayer undergirded everything that he did. 15 prayers in 13 verses. 
That's how he was able to stay so strong to his convictions. That's how he could see through the false plots of his enemies. That's how he kept sane in the midst of all of this. We've got long, formal prayers that were maybe memorized. There's short kind of one word arrow prayers that he shoots into the heavens. There are silent prayers. And then there's just attitudes of prayer. Everything he does is undergirded in prayer in a constant and hopeful connection to the divine. So let's talk about these chapters. Let's think about them. First of all, is it feasible to forgive debts like Nehemiah and to eliminate predatory interest and in collateral systems? If so, is there a role that Christians can play in this? Um, can churches leverage their resources or influence to make this sort of thing happen? Or is it all just a pipe dream? And number two, what do we do when people don't want us to succeed, when they're actively working against us? Can you think of a time when somebody actively stood in your way, when the thing that you were doing seemed like the right thing to do? How did you convince them that it was the right thing to do? Or how did you keep your nose down and keep going despite the negative words and the rumors that they were spreading about you? How do you keep the faith in the midst of bad faith actors. Let's talk about it. 